I'm going to be talking about how you can create an amazing team to invent the future. Essentially, how do you uh, take the capability of technology and apply it to the behaviours and expectations of the public today? So I'm going to talk about teams and what it takes to build a team to surf this tsunami. So take that image. But I'm going to be a bit naughty and cheat uh, and start where I was asked to end, which was to leave you with a thought, a provocation. Um, so forgive me a brief philosophical preamble. <clears throat> so 20-ish, a bit more than 20 years ago, I was a, an engineering student, well, pretending to be an engineering student. I was actually spending most of my time messing around on the internet uh, with pretensions to be a journalist. Didn't really know what I was going to do with my life, but I made things, and I pretended I could write. I couldn't write. Um, and then one day, I saw a magazine cover, uh, and it genuinely changed my life. Uh, it was a magazine. It was called Wired Magazine. It was the first issue of the UK edition of Wired Magazine, uh, April 1994. I bought it, I consumed it, I knew I wanted to be. I wanted to work for this magazine and report from the front line of the digital revolution. I wanted to be there. And I was lucky enough to be able to do so. <coughs> this was the magazine, this was the cover, this was the article that genuinely changed my life. And the cover feature was a ridiculous, in hindsight, profile of Thomas Paine, the, the, uh, you know, the philosopher of the American Revolution, arguably. Uh, and he was claiming pain as the sort of philosophical forefather of the internet. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. Come this revolution, we can think like pain thought about America and change everything if we want to. We have the power. 20 years on, when I read that, the thing I look at is the we. Who is the we? Because I think, actually, in the medium term, he was right, actually. We do have the power to begin a lot of things again, just like Bazalgette had the power to give clean, <coughs> clean sanitation to London. But we in this room have more power than the vast majority of people to shape this future that is uh, emerging at different, different paces, arguably, but a very different future for society, for individuals, for companies, for governments. And the phrase I want to leave you with, the thought I want to leave you with is, Software is politics now. The decisions we make, you make, with your teams in terms of the software that underpins the products and services of today and tomorrow inherently has within it power dynamics that affect the liberty, the, the, the transparency, uh, the power of the organizations that you're working for, and the relative power of the individuals uh, who use those services. Software never has been neutral. Never. The decisions you make about how transparent you are about your algorithms, <coughs> how careful you are to make sure people are genuinely informed about the data you're collecting and the use you're, you're taking of it, the architectural care that you take to ensure that when your systems get breached, and they will, the data breaches are mitigated. They are, I believe now, political decisions that impact the power that the individual has in terms of relationships with corporations, the state, and other individuals too. And my challenge to you today is to take that back to your team and see what they think. Do they see the software they're writing as inherently political? With a little p, I should stress. Right, enough philosophy. So, teams. Um, I was asked to describe what I thought uh, a wonderful team that was brilliantly capable of surfing this wave of change. Uh, in terms of the services and products it, was, it, was, uh, it made, would be. And I left government four months ago, uh, uh, and I've really been looking forward to this very moment, because I'm going to talk about just one team, and they are, by some margin, the most impressive team I've ever seen work, and in the most unlikely place, because I'm going to talk about universal credit. Uh, universal credit, a complete radical policy transformation in how we support those on welfare. 20 million people's lives impacted many of the most vulnerable people in society. A fundamental transformation from six 
quite old-fashioned benefits that were disconnected, discordant with big cracks between them that had all sorts of perverse incentives and complexities and failure and built in. Some of those benefits were run by DWP, some by HMRC, some by local councils. A complete beginning again that was real-time, adapted to people's circumstances in as close to real-time as possible and genuinely supported people back into work. That's the political ambition, which actually has broad party political support underneath all the noise. And when you go to DWP, you very rarely find a person who fights against that goal. This is the biggest change since 1948, since the establishment. Uh, the biggest change in the potential for improving the support we're able to give welfare claimants since 1948 is a phrase you'll often hear back. And they mean it. Everybody in DWP means it. However, it has not been without its problems. And in 2013, I was invited, is not the word, asked, to join a team that was going in to review universal credit. Um, and the very first thing I did was ask to see universal credit. Can I see it? Can I see where you've got to? Show me universal credit. This was three years in. They'd spent several hundred million. And they were, by the way, the people who'd done this work, every single one of them that I met was a fully professional, committed technologist. None of these people were unprofessional. The thousand odd people that have been involved. Suppliers and civil servants. Notwithstanding all the negative press. These were impressive people. But they hit the end of the line, really, in terms of how they've been able to go. And when I, when the reason became apparent quite swiftly to me. Because when I asked to see Universal Credit, along with fellow members of the review panel, this is what I was given. Literally this document. An early version of this document. That is not universal credit. That is 600 pieces of paper with words on it. Okay, but as far as DWP was concerned, that was universal credit. The policy was universal credit. The notion that you were building a service here, which people interacted with, that the incentives, be they explicit or implicit, that were at play, were very unpredictable, that bits of the policy may be logically inconsistent with each other, that the data model might be hard to define, shall we put it. None of these have been thought through by the civil servants who'd written 600 pages of dense policy full of thousands of assumptions about human behavior. And the poor IT team have been asked to build it. I have only one criticism of that team, the IT team from DWP. They should have said no. <laughs> they should have said no not taking 600 pages of hypotheses about human behavior amongst the most vulnerable members of society and building you an IT system. The report was pretty negative, and DWP reset the entire program. Uh, the existing system has been rolled out to very, very simple claimants, uh, a handful in each job center, many job centers around the country. But DWP did a very brave and, I think, right thing after this. They started again. They don't necessarily say so in public, but they started again. And they started again very, very, very differently. Um, and when you ask, I actually did a sort of follow-up review about a year ago now, just under a year ago now. Um, and when you go and ask, when I asked the same question, can you show me universal credit? So this, the team that's building what's called the digital version of universal credit, it's really version two. Um, they showed me a thing. This is it. This is universal credit. They called it an alpha. It was dead simple. I understood it. What they actually showed me was even more impressive than this, which I can't show you. It was a video of a dozen different claimants of very, very different circumstances using this service for real. They showed people interacting with the service uh, as part of a user research exercise that they undertake every other week to understand where the incentives at play, where the behaviors that are like to follow from the universal credit the service aligned with the intent of the minister, Ian Duncan Smith. Was this thing working as intended? And actually, the results, I think, are reasonably positive. I'm going to talk to you about that team, because they're amazing. They really are amazing. Um, uh, by the way, if you want to learn more, I blogged about it. The last thing I did before I left government, knowing I couldn't get into trouble once I'd quit, was blog about that team. So if you want to learn more, you can read about it on the blog. Um, so let me tell you about the team. This is Nancy. Okay, Nancy is a 25-year housing frontline veteran. She has helped people with housing benefit for 25 years. She was on the team. She didn't work for DWP before. She worked for a housing charity. They went and found Nancy. She's holding Wibble the pig. 
Wibble is a squeaky pig, very important for the culture of this team. So he's Waffle, Waffle the pig, not Wibble, Waffle the pig. Nancy would squeeze Waffle when anybody waffled. Sounds like a little thing, okay? The person behind Waffle here is Ian Duncan Smith, okay? Ian Duncan Smith has just visited the team to give them, uh, 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 to, well, they had shown him the results of the first seven sprints that they'd done, so the first sort of 10, 12 weeks work. And, and she's really pleased because she hasn't had to squeeze Waffle. She had warned him that she would if he waffled. And I tell you why, he was fantastic. Because the, uh, he was asked the first question uh, in Duncan Smith. Uh, forget the politics. Uh, this was an amazing moment. What is universal credit? What's it for? One of the team members, Lara, asked him. And he said this. That more people find more work more of the time while supporting those who can't. That's what he wanted. That was his political vision. Now, the wonderful thing about this, you can argue about the politics and the, and the, 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 the different edge, edges of the policy. But he had been able to express a vision for what he wanted, the outcome he wanted in very simple, clear language. The team had a vision from the minister in terms of the outcome they wanted. Vitally important. Has your team got a clear vision about the outcome they want? That every single member of the team can repeat to each other, can repeat to themselves, and they have to make every single decision? So right down to the bottom of your organization, every team member knows what we're here to do in simple, clear language that they understand. Ian Lucas Smith did that without even knowing to his credit. Hence, Waffle didn't get squeaked. Um, secondly, let me show you the second thing about this team did. This is the existing process for de delivering government service. This is my rather pejorative view. Someone write a policy, someone else, different team, guess the requirements. Someone else, the usually lawyers, procured an IT system, which then got built usually in India or somewhere. It was then inflicted on the users too early for it to be mature, and the poor bastards had to operate it at the front line, and, and you know, then it never changed. That's very pejorative. But broadly, that was the process, broadly. Um, not for everything, but for certainly for a, a significant number of, uh, of services that I view. Um, I don't think that's right, my personal view. I don't think you can guess the requirements. I don't think you can write policy that isn't full of hypotheses and think it has any real relevance in the real world without starting with what does that mean for people, starting with the needs of users, starting humbly about what do you actually know about behavior in the context of the policy, and then iterating and iterating and iterating and iterating and iterating in a humble, quick, rapid way, uh, uh, rather than thinking you know everything up front. So standard sort of iterative, agile stuff. Um, second thing, does your team iterate and learn? This team really, they were working in week-long sprints at the start, every single week going out and finding real users and testing a thing that mattered they thought was important, an assumption they wanted to test. And they're only building things they knew were valuable. So they would ask questions like, what have we proved in this sprint, in this two-week or one-week cycle? What have we learned about the needs of our users that we didn't know before? What have we learned about the design of our service? Does it meet those needs? Does it deliver the policy intent or not? And what do we know about the operating model we need to be at play here? How are we going to operate this service? How can we iterate that? How can we learn about what actually works in practice, not in theory? So here's the team. Here's the team after um, uh, about three months, two and a half months work. Um, sec third thing to note about the team. They are radically multidisciplinary. Extraordinarily so, actually. So in that picture, you have some amazing technical architects, actually. Some fantastic software developers. You also have fantastic designers. An amazing user researcher who's really an ethnographer, anthropologist, who was incredible, the one who's standing up, absolute at the heartbeat of the team. You had a product manager who was incredibly brave. You had a policy expert who was empowered to look at policy and make recommendations to the minister. Uh, you had a security person not from an area not an adjacent to Cheltenham. Um, you had business analysts. Uh, uh, you had, crucially, people who had operated for years and decades at the front line and met real claimants day in, day out from different contexts, from HMRC, from from Housing Benefit World and from DWP. The teams that deliver great services are a mixture of multidisciplinary skills, of which the IT people are only a part. And if you go back to the thing that was on the slide at the start, saying the IT team isn't dead, it's just resting. Well, I don't think it's even resting. It's joined everybody else, if it works. It's not a thing by itself. It's part of a multidisciplinary team. Culture diversity matters enormously, too. This is a picture that one of our developers drew, believe it or not. Um, developers can draw. Who knew? Um, a culture is diverse in terms of people's perspectives, not just their disciplinary expertise. And the team used a language that Simon Wardley had developed. I don't know if you know Simon Wardley. 
about how their different preferences and expertise were in terms of how they saw the world. Some of them were pioneers. We're here to invent things. I'm the designer. I'm going to go invent. Some of the developers were very pioneering. We want to go invent the future quickly. You know, a week. Let's go and build a prototype. Some of them were settlers. They were like, okay, that's great. I see that. That's good. But culturally, it's a bit messy and we can't support it. How can we make this supportable? How can we produce components that are reproducible? Not just technically, but operationally. How can we repeat that wonderful interaction that you've designed between the frontline work coach, uh, where they're sitting, they're sitting next to the claimant, not across from them? How do I repeat that in lots of job centers? And then finally, there were the town planners who were doing things like, how do I get the network to be massive? How do I... How do I rent enough buildings in enough of the right places to be able to support this? Very different mindsets, cultural preferences about, about how they thought. They had, I think more by luck, if I'm honest, they had a very balanced set of people in that team in terms of their cultural preferences, and they respected each other's viewpoints. When I hear Gartner talk about bimodal, they miss the settlers in the middle. And without the settlers, you've just got to fight between the digital people and the old people. Okay? I think it's rubbish, personally. I think you need all three. You need the settlers to take what's been learned and work out how to make it scale and supportable, as well as town planning. And they need to respect each other. This team absolutely obsessed about the needs of their users. Every conversation went back and said, what do we know about who's using this service? Be it a, a, a claimant or a frontline worker. Everything came back to people and their response to the service. Not a hypothesis, a proven, observed fact. And they talked about user research being a team sport. This wasn't a department going off and doing research and coming back with a report. They would all go and watch a live video stream of a research session every week uh, and watch it together. They'd see, you'd walk in their office and they'd all be staring at the screens. And they'd go, what are you doing? Watching the research. They all wanted to know what was happening about the thing they built last week or what they're learning about what they might build next week. They start small and they stayed small. That literally was the team you saw in the first photo. And they, they kicked people out if they didn't have the right cultural fit, if they weren't earning value, because they knew if you add one person, there's an overhead. If you have the wrong person, you'll kill the team. They're really obsessed with staying small, as small as they could. And they stayed small. They, they, their preference was to stay small. I've talked about it. They loved showing the thing. The show, the, the, the show and tell, as they call it, where they showed what they'd done in the previous two weeks. Uh, they complete open door policy inside DWP and other bits of government. And in the first sort of two or three sprints, they'd get sort of 15 people there. There's now several hundred people turning up, literally flying down from Scotland to go to the show and tell where they show what they've done, what have we learned, what have we built this week, this sprint, what have we learned about what we built previously. Com they would love to be blogging about what they're doing every day, culturally, if they could. Now, politically, they can't, but they love showing what they've done. Here it is again. Um, they're obsessed with making things simple, doing the hard work to make things simple, not just look simple, but be simple. To give you an example, um, currently in the current benefits regime, to prove your entitlement to something, inevitably in the, in the current regime, involves everybody producing a whole bunch of documents that have to be scanned in and sent through the post and lost. And people, failure demand all over the place. People losing, you know, losing benefits because DWPs kind of drop stuff between the cracks of documents. Those documents are meant to be a deterrent against fraud. Do you know how easy it is to download a rent agreement off the internet and put your... It's absolutely trivial. There's no deterrence at all. No deterrence at all. And for most people, most of the time, forget the Daily Mail headlines, most people just want to do the right thing and get the benefit, and they don't want to scam you. It's, there's a hardcore that do. Um, the, the team did amazing work to convince, if I'm honest, some of the more conservative elements within DWP that they would take a risk based approach to ver verification and document validation. Dynamic, both in terms of the individual and the time of year. If a new risk profile came, they would, they would... But for most people, most of the time, the process is much, much simpler. There's far fewer, in fact, virtually no documents being winged around the system to cause failure. They're a really humble team. They kind of know what they know and know what they don't know, and they know how much they don't know. They're really, really careful to say things that are true when they really don't know. And they're really angry when their false certainty is demanded of them. When are we going to be finished with this component? You know, uh, how many people will successfully complete this thing once you've built it? The only honest answer that they give repeatedly and caused huge friction in the early months and years of this, this way of working was, we don't know. And neither do you. 
So I'm not going to put a false piece of certainty on your Gantt chart just because your boss wants one. Don't lie to the minister, please. We don't know. Tell that to the minister. And the minister, right from the first moment he heard this approach, loved it. He said, brilliant, no one's lying to me again. Can I come to the show and tell? Culturally, wow, that was a change. Really brave people from DWP, amazing people, and HMRC. Um, they own their own process. So they don't take a cookie cutter approach to, we're running Scrum, and we must follow these steps and it'll all be fine, because they know it won't. The retrospective at the end of every two or one week sprint, they examine what was right, what worked about the process for them, what didn't work, and they'll change it if it didn't work and test it for a week. They own their process, they doesn't own them. This relates to the early point about starting small. When they need to scale, they'll scale organically. They'll spin off a new team, and the unit of delivery is the team, not the person or the resource. They'll spin up a new team only when the team goes, OK, we know that piece of work needs doing. We know we can safely keep our culture intact if we spin this team up. And they, they've only got five teams, development teams running in parallel at the moment. That they won't go any, any further because they don't think they can keep the culture intact uh, beyond five teams. There's about 150 people um, around the place at the moment. They're dead right. These are them. Uh, I have so much affection and respect for these people, incredible civil servants. Um, Deborah on the left, uh, as you see it, 25-year frontline veteran from uh, DWP, been in every job centre in the country, knows everything about people's lives that I thought I knew about but really didn't. Domestic violence, abuse, all the couples splitting and coming together on a daily basis, the reality of welfare claims. Richard, the guy at the back, the most incredible developer and designer I've ever met, complete introverted geek, genuine genius, genuinely understands that software is politics. He's actually working for the Labour Party now, it's quite interesting. Uh, and Lara there, who's incredibly posh and can charm any minister uh, with her detailed knowledge of every aspect of policy uh, uh, and equally defend the team when people turn up and say, I need to know what they are. When are you going to deliver this shit? Really tough Scottish woman. Incredibly brave people. And the final... Uh, attribute of this team that I want to focus on is their boldness. They were really bold. Uh, and boldness has, as Gertha said, a genius, power, and magic in it. That'll do for you, see. They were the aspects of that team. Final little point. How do you get people like Richard, for example, into government? Lara and Deborah are already there. Okay? Those brave, brilliant civil servants there. Richard wasn't before. Richard the and neither were these two. This is Daffoth and, and, and Maz. Daffoth is the technical architect in DVLA, as they've redone, and, and Maz did a lot of the development work on, uh, on, on gov.uk, senior developer there. If you'd asked them six years ago would they work for government, they would genuinely have laughed at you. Um, and yet here they are in number 10. They were invited there. They hadn't just blagged their way in. <laughs> <laughs> they really were invited there. Um, they didn't join to fix government IT. They wanted to join because they saw an opportunity to fix government, to do something that matters, to really do something that matters. And if you can create a context where your team understands that what it does really matters, really makes a difference, that what they're doing is reshaping the relationship between citizens, consumers, corporations, the state, you know, laying the railway tracks of a new settlement, civic settlement, uh, then you can get anyone to work for your team, in my experience, even in government. That'll do for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>